should get started. So um, I'd just like to welcome everyone to this, the uh, fourth lecture uh, in the, this year's winter lecture series. So for those of you who don't know, my name is James Wright, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Terry Collins, uh, who will give today's uh, lecture. Uh, the lecture is entitled, uh, Learning to Love the Future Through Green Science. Professor Collins is the Teresa Hines Professor of Green Chemistry and Director of the Institute of Green Science at Carnegie Mellon University, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, he is also an honorary professor and distinguished alumnus of the University of Auckland. Uh, and as you might expect, perhaps, uh, Professor Collins earned his doctorate degree from the University of Auckland. Um, he then uh, conducted postdoctoral uh, studies at Stanford University. Uh, he taught first at Caltech uh, and then joined the faculty of Carnegie Mellon University uh, in 1987. He started teaching green chemistry in 1992, creating the first course of this type anywhere. His pioneering research, which uh, has helped to develop the interface between chemistry and sustainability, began before green chemistry was even a recognised discipline. His achievements have been acknowledged in uh, many awards, including the US Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge Award in 1999, the Pittsburgh Award of the American Chemical Society, the Award of the uh, New York Metropolitan C Catalysis Society, uh, the Charles E. Kaufman Award of the Pittsburgh Foundation, the Heinz Award for Environment, uh, and the Fellowship of the American Chemical Society. So recognised internationally for his groundbreaking research on Tamil activators, his green chemistry education and public speaking uh, on the chemistry dimension of sustainability, Professor Collins continues to champion uh, the sustainability cause. Uh, and I now invite you, Terry, to come and, and present your lecture. Oh. Well, well, thank you very much, James. It's a great pleasure always to come back to New Zealand and to be here in this uh, beautiful city. I think my heart's in America, but my soul might be here. Um, learning to love the future of your green science. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin talking very broadly. Then I'm going to come and discuss how we approach developing chemistry for sustainability at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon. Mellon. And, and then, then we're, we're going to come back, back to some... the evidence says crystal clear, to handle that power well. Uh, we think in the short term, we think about our families educating, feeding them, the grandkids, etc. we'll see that. We don't think about human beings five generations, ten generations out. And we didn't have to in the past because we didn't have the powers that we have now. With the powers we have, we have the power to completely mess everything up. And apparently, at least from my reading, that is what is happening now. So the need to bring sustainability into universities, which after all train the leaders of the civilization, is probably the most critical single intellectual need that we have um, in the modern university. It brings transgenerational justice to the, to the center of our civilization's ec ec uh, ethical stage. If we don't address it, there is no good future. Um, and so really, this is our, our first granddaughter uh, on the day that she, she was born. It really is thinking about the present and, and the future. And if you think when you get one of these, they're, you know, mum and dad are really happy. Granddad and grandma are really happy. And this baby will perhaps go on and have its own generation. And if your granddad and grandma is we are, we are now, we might see that baby. And then something happens. This comes along. And so actually, I think the world would be very different if we lived, instead of for a bit less than 100 years, for three, four, five hundred years. Because 
it's on the order of 100 years, the scale on which things, the disasters playing out in slow mo, um, that's the prob problem, that we, we are not, if it was impacting us personally and we could see it, we might be a little bit different. But in actual fact, as we know, this is really what we want to think about. We need to be thinking, as never before, we never had the need to before, about the, the, what happens to our species and to everything else moving forward. And I would argue chemistry is actually central to that inter intellectual construct. Uh, it's really about developing an intimacy for the future and the present, really deep in the core of each human being. Some, something we've never had to do before. So it's Al Gore um, shows this picture in his, uh, what I, I, I consider great, great movies. Uh, this is um, Apollo 8, the first manned mission to the moon, sent this picture back December 24, uh, 1968. Well, we saw that picture. I think we didn't have color television, but we saw the picture. Um, here's a, what the uh, pilot said, oh, the vast loneliness is awe-inspiring, and it makes you realize just what you have back there on Earth. And so here's the Earth from, taken from picture from under the, the rings of Saturn uh, by the Cassini spacecraft. That's, that's one and a half billion kilometers from Earth, this tiny little dot out there. This is our garden of Venus, the precious singularity, the palace of all known life, our only visible home, our greatest joy, our everything. And securing its good future is the greatest test we've ever had of our intelligence and character as a species. So, you know, probably all know this has got to be quite famous, but I, I remember once, I, I, I came back to New Zealand and we went up north to, to a beach with friends and um, the, they had, there was dust. I, I'm very allergic to dust, so I couldn't sleep. So I went out for a walk at like three in the morning and I, I'm, I was, there was no light, but I was able to walk and eventually I looked up and, and there it was. Um, the starlight was extraordinary. Uh, that's our galaxy alone, and as far as we know, there's nothing there other than us in terms of life. We are a singularity, as far as we know. And here's our friends next door. Um, this is my, what Gord makes very clear, is that everything that's precious actually isn't the Earth, it's in this very thin skin about 10 miles from the bottom of the ocean to the top of Everest. So it's unbelievably tiny and fragile. And here we are. Um, chemical technologies present really three, it, it, it truly is chemistry, at the technological core of all the major threats to, to civilization, there is chemistry. And there are three existential threats to this chiffon thin, ecospherical skin of life. First of all, there's climate change, and uh, you may say we have leaders in America who, who don't think it's happening. Um, the evidence is completely overwhelming. It's happening, it's happening now. We actually have islands in the, in the um, uh, off New Orleans that are going underwater rapidly. The people are all having to move. Um, we're losing, as you know, the beautiful islands, atolls of the Pacific, and Presumably, some of the Mal Mal some of the um, Kiribati people and the and the Tuvaluans are coming here because of it. Um, nuclear misadventure or mishap is a really big threat. It's almost fortunate we had Fukushima. It's horrible to say, uh, but now the argument that we won't have one of these accidents in a in a jurisdiction where we're not supposed to have one is crystal clear. That is still absolutely out of control absolutely out of control. And finally, we have the thing that my group is most interested in, the low dose toxicity of everyday everywhere chemicals, and we'll talk a lot about that. New Zealand can really contribute powerfully to the, to the future good by deepening national competence and dealing with these threats. And you could make of yourself an example to the world. You are uniquely blessed. You're, you're isolated. You have a fantastic climate. There aren't too many people that may, the more you get, the more difficult it gets to organize things. And actually, the things that you have to do are really logically fairly straightforward. 
And so if New Zealand decided to make of itself an icon of sustainability, for example, solarize your, your energy base as quickly as possible, of course, people would say it costs too much now. But actually, once you've got it, the energy's free from then on out. A generation or two out, you're hugely advantaged if you do this, in my opinion, anyway. Um, so we'll be focusing on the low-dose toxicity. Now, this is a chemical. I know there's some chemists that are not in the room, but for the chemists, this is bisphenol A. Um, we make about 18 billion pounds a year, um, and it's literally in everything, and it's an estrogen. So we will come back to that later. We reviewed that, and in fact, we conducted a study that included the University of Auckland, some of the James and Narish Langala here in the audience and their students did part of this work. Um, this is a 30 page paper where we review everywhere where you can find BPA. And as far as I can tell, there isn't anywhere where you can't. You can find BPA in translucent, transparent shrimp on the, uh, in, in the Marianas Trench. It's everywhere. It's an estrogen. Um, in animal studies, uh, we've extensively validated associations with breast and, and prostate cancer. I'll come back to that. So how does a chemist begin to interact with the world to try to figure out toxicity, particularly this incredibly threatening low-dose toxicity that I'll go on and on about? And I'm in a very fortunate position. I get to move around the world a lot and meet people um, and make friends with the kind of people who are doing the right kind of research to answer the right kinds of questions. And so we held a conference. I significantly chose the speakers at this incredibly beautiful Phipps Conservatory. It's run by a genius, Richard Piancentini. You'll see him shortly. And if you want to know how to do a green building, <laughs> come to Pittsburgh and talk to, to Richard. This, this thing is unbelievably green, everything about it. So this was the party we had it uh, last March. One health idea is that human, animal, and environmental health are all connected. And that's something that really resonates with Professor Fipp. And we think that there's a great value in bringing people together from lots of different disciplines to talk about some of the issues that they see in each of their areas to really try to understand how this is affecting the broad spectrum of different disciplines. That's Pete Myers, who can, uh, coined the term endric and disruption. Amazing color. And the system is broken because chemicals do not have to be proved safe before they can be put into the marketplace. That's Shana Swan, who reviewed the literature and showed we have a... I'll, I'll come back. Tyrone Hayes uh, is a remarkable character. Just because it's legal doesn't have to be the same. The transition. Dominated by infectious diseases that are communicable to one of a world dominated by non communicable diseases, many of which are related to misbehaviors of the endocrine system, the hormone system. This problem is as big and maybe even more fast acting than the climate problem. There's a lot of risk here, but we don't have a common shared vision of where we land. It's kind of obvious to have the scientists together to where they share more vision and hopefully we'll share that with their students in science, their students in other courses, and with the public. Our problems of sustainable chemistry today are not primarily technical, they're almost overwhelmed with culture. People tend to work in their own silos, we need to break out of silos. We need to get people to start talking with each other and recognize that some of the issues and problems that we think we're addressing not just happening to us with the groups that we're associated with, it's happening everywhere else. We're all in this together. We all have a piece of the puzzle and we want to do the best we can to educate those around us on these topics. By bringing this kind of multidisciplinary group together, I think we can really solve these important challenges to the future of our planet much more rapidly. So if you want to see this, it's online. You can go and look. There are five short videos, and then everybody's talk is there. Um, so 
Now to the psychology part, <laughs> at, least, at least my version of it. If you, what I've come to realize is that human beings, when they build constructs, um, particularly pyramidal constructs, such as um, an academic discipline or a, a university, um, really primarily focus on interacting with each other to gain approval, to gain support, to get funding, to do their stuff. It's very, very much a human um, dynamic. It's like a fluffy cloud, though. It's moving. It's changing shape all the time. All very anthropocentric. Um, and it has beneath it the f a firmament of reality, which is the ecosphere, um, towards which this fluffy cloud is deeply unrealistic and brutally dismissive. Our future as a species really depends on how we adapt the fluffy cloud, our political, social, and, and interactiveness to the demands of the firmament of reality. Um, in the fluffy cloud, there are some principles. It's a dollar first in all things business. Problem with the dollar bill is that it's immediate value, not, it doesn't, it, do, it doesn't compensate for negative value in the future of many of our technologies. Very present oriented. It's clever, but it's unwise. It's isolating in specializations. It's deeply tribal. Um, and when, this brings us to um, when we develop a, a chemical technology is there are two critical things. Does the technology perform well? And does it have good cost performance? And so if you have something like a fast car, it's better than a slow car, most people think. Same with chemistry, a, good, a wonderful reaction or a powerful drug um, that can make money, off it goes to the marketplace. However, every chemical also has a health performance. And you are carrying about more than a thousand chemicals probably that were not in the urine of your grandparents. And some of these chemicals are bioactive uh, in animals at the concentrations found in your, in your urine, bioactive negatively. There's an environmental performance. So for example, the reproductive pill, 10 millionths of a gram in each pill of the active estrogen, ethanol estradiol. You f start feminizing male fish of certain species at subparts per trillion. European rivers are running four to six parts per trillion and they've got a big problem. We've lost many, we've lost species of fish, quite literally, from the rivers of Pennsylvania because of estrogenization. Um, there are multiple things, but ethanol estradiol is a really powerful contributor. And finally, there's a fairness performance that essentially uh, takes on all sorts of various forms depending on how, how you think about it. I haven't time to reflect on that too much. But if we really succeed, the value proposition for sustainable chemical technology is going to look like this. It'll have, yeah, you have, to, you have to make money, you have to work well, but you're not going to hurt health, you are going to be fair, and you're not going to hurt the environment. So that's the challenge. Can we do this? Can we figure this out? Um, and so back to the gossamer thin skin of the, of the planet. This is the ecosphere. This 10 miles or so, maybe 15, maybe 20, depends on what you want to count. Um, and there are really two places where we human beings assault that mercilessly. One is with energy. Now we bring in to the economy every single year about 10 gigatons of carbon, most of which is burned to run the energy system. We don't do absolutely nothing else on that scale. Nothing. We don't make a gigaton of, poly of polymers. So that if we were able to pull a switch here and stop the carbon flow in, and the resulting 40 gigatons of CO2 going out, the world would be totally different with respect to sustainability. We have to deal with the energy problem. And so the other is toxics, and the frightening part of it is low-dose toxics. So 
the eco economy is actually a subsystem of the ecosphere. I mean, how can you have a grocery store without animals, eggs and meat, etc., and on and on you go if you think about it. Um, That's happened here. I might have to go. Something's going wrong with my. Um, okay, so every day, tens of millions of tons of stuff comes in from the ecosphere to feed the economy. What then happens when it gets in there is chemists take a sizable hunk of it and turn it into other stuff. These are the drugs, the polymers, all the things that, and it cycles around in the economy, and eventually the used economically spent matter gets ejected back to the ecosphere. So your sustainability issues have to do with the incoming, stuff in the middle, and the outgoing. So the chemical enterprise, will it work? Okay. So, Chemists work over here on extraction processes primarily. Um, we've got some of the solar going on, really critical. We need much more, as I, as I pointed out. Here we make all the stuff that, that, you, that run the civilization. And here we sort of manage the waste, but we don't really. This is the least, this is one of the most serious problems, the red arrow, and it's the least focused on by chemists because, well, you can't really make money from you know, waste material and water and stuff like that. So the Institute for Green Science focuses right there at the exit point from the economy to the ecosphere of matter, my, my institute. Um, and you ask yourself, how can you parameterize these health, environmental and fairness performances? We're very lucky, the catalyst I'll tell you about has spectacular cost and, and um, technical performance. So we don't have to worry about that, the normal thing people are, are worrying about. We approach parameterizing health, environmental films and forms by just, as I said, finding the right people to work with um, and getting together and asking the questions, how do we do this? How do we, how do we tackle building these performances into new technologies? And the group that I've had the privilege to work with is really extraordinary. And I, I kind of view it as like a, a co an international college, a virtual college, really, for sustainability. We spend a lot of time on the internet. We talk, talk um, almost daily with some of these guys. All right. So now we'll come and talk about the catalyst, what we actually do. So starting in 1980, I had the idea that if you could only disinfect water with, with um, hydrogen peroxide rather than chlorine, you'd get rid of all the chlorinated disinfection byproducts, some of which are associated quite strongly with, with certain cancers in human beings. Uh, but hydrogen peroxide has the thermodynamic power to break down, uh, to kill bugs, but not the, but not the kinetics, not, it's not fast enough. You need a catalyst to speed it up. And so the catalyst that we would uh, talk about, we'll come back and even look at this thing again, there's an iron atom in the center, there's four nitrogens surrounding it, and these gray rings are organic matter that are the critical part, we fiddle the gray rings. There's a water molecule sitting on the bottom. Um, and the way we, des the way the catalyst design pro protocol started in 1980 and running very strong to this day is the following. You begin on 1980 imagining what you think the gray blue thing should look like and you make it. Um, and then you test it. Um, and the problem is you're going to make when you, when you put peroxide with this catalyst, you're going to make something that's really reactive. It's got to go and kill bugs, actually, and burn molecules, it turns out, we found out later in the water. But, but it's going to be really reactive. So what it does is it kills itself. It either commits suicide or, or, or homicide, depending on whether it's attacking itself or, or another molecule. Um, and that's bad, because you want it to live long enough to do, to do work. So what we did that was unusual is we, when something didn't work, we didn't abandon it. We went and found out how it was decaying. And that, you would just think of like a chain, we find the weakest point in the chain. And then we use our chemical intuition to make that weak point stronger and make us an iterated catalyst. And around this, around this ring we go again. And 
systematically over time, the catalysts get better and better. And so actually, um, you through the years, you see going down there, you spin around, over a 15 year period, we ended up um, with what are called Tamil activators. So these are molecules that are less than 1% the size of the enzymes that do this highly efficient chemistry with peroxide, um, but they outperform the enzymes. It's the first time anybody's actually got anything within PUI of the enzyme activity, but we're actually outperforming them, and we were very early on. And then um, we discovered that there was a fundamental weakness in our original design about three or four years ago, and we continued to develop, and now we have, fortunately, because we've got brand new patents, um, spectacular, um, uh, even, more, even better catalysts. So this brings us to how do you think about a problem like this? And I'm, I'm focusing on the logic rather than the details because I know a lot of people here aren't chemists. And so I see five intersecting loops like cogs in the design of, of um, the sustainable products that we're after. The first is inside this green box and it's called the design loop. So, you want to make a small molecule oxidation catalyst candidate. We started there in 1980. Um, the current best catalyst after, after all those years is, is, um, is more than 30 or 40 catalysts actually into the design. Um, you test the technical performance once you get it. Um, uh, today's, uh, the best catalyst we've got right now is achieved in 2017. Um, this thing is already competitive with hydrogen peroxide with ozone, which is what Europe is considering to remove micropollutants from its municipal wastewater. Um, but we think that we'll, we're, we're, I'm sure it's going to get better. Maybe 10 times, maybe as much as 1,000 times better. And when you do that, um, you have a big impact on, on the cost of the technologies. Um, if you find it requires improvement, and we're always trying to improve it anyway, but sometimes you find you have to improve it, you redesign the catalyst, you come back here, and that's a design loop. You just keep going around it. So that's the iterative design loop. Now, let's suppose you eventually get to the point where you've got a catalyst that you really like. So today, the new Tamil catalysts are ready for large-scale commercial development. We have commercially developed one of the older cat catalysts reasonably significantly. But unlike ozone, chlorine, or UV peroxide that people use, these are not one reagent. You can change the catalyst, and when you do, you change the activity. Um, so the remarkable feature um, of the rear design loop is that we can continue to build immense savings and sustainability into new Tamil-based water treatment by iteratively designing for higher technical and economic performances um, to attain superior drop-in replacements. And we've never had this possibility before of water treatment. Um, now, if it's acceptable, if you get to something, then you ask the question, is it safe? 10 years ago, nobody knew how to tell if any chemical was safe from these low dose adverse effects. So this team of people I've talked about, and you'll see them soon, got together and said, well, how do we, how do we make it safe? And it would be like me saying, I don't want to take too much credit because it was, uh, everybody was a big part of it, but I've got, well, you're Mr. Estrogen. You, un you understand the estrogen um, uh, horm part of the hormone system. And you're Mr. Androgen, and you're Mrs. Thyroid, and you're Mr. Pituitary, and you're Mr. Such and Such. What tests do we have to pass with any chemical to make you happy that we don't have an estrogen, an androgen, a thyroid-like hormone, et cetera? And we spent five years on that problem, uh, phone calls weekly, then ev even more often, several retreats, and eventually published a paper um, doing it. So we now know how to tell, um, to the highest levels of, at least of contemporary science, whether or not you have um, a safe or unsafe catalyst. If it's not acceptable for safety, you go back to the design board. So we now come to a major civilizational problem. The problem of how we test for the safety of a chemical. And actually, the basic underlying principle is 400 years old. It traces back to a guy called Paracelsus, and what he said is often uh, short, 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 uh, 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 captured and precede in the statement, the dose makes the poison. 
So we start at a high dose and we, we lower the dose until we reach, if we're studying animals, and out, say an LD50. 50% of the animals will die within this period of time. And then we keep going down until we um, uh, reach a low L, a lowest observed adverse effect level. And then we keep going down till you get a no L, no observed adverse effect level. And then the regular days come in and say, well, we want to be safer than that, so they set a daily exposure one to two orders of magnitude lower. The problem is the endocrine system works at infinitesimal concentrations, and it's not accounted for in this. So we really should turn the testing protocol upside down. This would create, uh, when, it, when we talk about it, a firestorm with industry, uh, but it needs to be done. Because of how the endocrine hormone system functions with hormone working at parts per trillion to low parts per billion levels, the historical dose makes the point, it's wrong. The low, our lowest observed adverse effect level obtained when you come from low to high is going to be different from when you come from, low, from high to low. Because you go through this window, of, if you start at an incredibly low dose and bring it up, you go through the window of activity of the endocrine system that you don't even test for when you're, when you're coming up here. And you might think, well, surely if I've got a lot up here, the endocrine system will recognize that. But no, it doesn't because cells have defense mechanisms and when there's enough material, too much material, they say, hey, I don't like this guy, and they turn on their defense mechanisms. So this is a huge change that we, we have to make. We need to turn it upside down. Um, if it's acceptable, you then go and you start, you say, okay, maybe I have, a, I have a safe commercial catalyst candidate. So you begin optimizing the commercial synthesis and we work with um, toll manufacturers to do that. Um, if the cost is unacceptable, well, back you go. <laughs> Start again. And then you break out of that. We've done once and we're sure to break out now with a new catalyst. And you go to bulk catalyst production. And then you start engaging with regulatory uh, agencies in the markets that you want to. And you run pilot trials. And you do demonstration plants. So that's the real world testing. And then once you've do, done that, if it's our catalysts, you, um, you, um, we, we think we have a major thing, poss possibly for miscible wastewater. You, um, you think about industrial wastewater as well, including oil and gas production. We have fabulous results there. Um, agricultural wastewater so that you can get the estrogens and the, and the antibiotics out of animal urine and feces if you, if you have a concentrated animal operation as we have many of in America. Um, and landfill leachate, it's astonishing. Landfill leachate is so estrogenic, nothing can live in it because of BPA. We'll tell you about this shortly. Nothing can live in landfill leachate. Um, it's the breakdown of polycarbonate cat plastic leaking BPA. And we're, BPA is thought to, is, is about 2,000th, 1 2,000th the, the strength of activity of estrogen, uh, estradiol, the natural female estrogen. So it's quite a weak estrogen. But if you raise the concentration to parts per million, parts per thousand, and parts per hundred, and you have that in landfill leachate, you completely overwhelm that difference, and you have a very potent estri estrogenic system. And the big goals are we want our rivers, lakes, and oceans to, to, to um, see revival of fish species. We want safer source water for human consumption. We want drinking water treatment follows. And so to pull all this off, so we're about here with the new catalyst. To pull all of this off, we need a lot of money <laughs> and um, we need partnerships and uh, the university will cut licenses with people to try to make that work. Um, I'm just going to go past this because I know I'm already speaking too slowly. Okay. So the team is what's me and um, at, at Carnegie Mellon, Alexander Ryabov, a Russian kineticist who's, who's phenomenal. Ru Sasha uh, studies the way the catalysts work, and he will tell you um, that um, these are as well understood as any, any, um, as any uh, catalytic system. Our water treatment experts at Brunel and Rat Kanda believes that our technology is going to be a lot cheaper and better than ozone. 
Um, we have a large interaction with Africa that we're trying to fund. We have 12 African countries that we have academics in various countries want to play with the catalyst to attack their water problems. It's led by this guy, Dr. Chimazia and Yakara at uh, University of Lagos. Douglas Fisher runs uh, the publication uh, network. If you want to understand endocrine disruption, just go and get above the fold. It's free from environmental health sciences. And every day you get information coming into your computer about how chemicals are impacting the environment. Douglas runs that. Our biological safety teams led by Julie Jones. It has Ruben Abayan, who does huge computer calculations of things. Bruce Blumberg, Bruce studied the catalysts and said, well, they're not estrogens, androgens, or um, thyroid hormones. Um, we, Heather is, I'm not gonna talk about her work. Uh, Fred von Saal, this is Mr. BPA. This guy's incredibly famous. He discovered the low dose adverse effects of BPA. He's had all sorts of fights. Industry tried to bribe him and he's very in front of people so he's public about it. Um, and has, his career has been about fighting um, to bring uh, reason to BPA. Um, and Fred um, studied with Julia Taylor our catalyst with mice assays to see if they were causing any problems with the mice, and they're not. Um, uh, Susan Nagel works with us on fracking uh, fluids. We have, we, have, we, 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 have, we have wonderful results there where we can remove the endocrine disruption activity of fracking fluids. Robert Tangway's Mr. Zebrafish, he has an enormous zebrafish lab, and so you do zebrafish developmental assays um, um, where you really find out if you've got problems for endocrine disruption, and Thomas Zoller is Mr. Thyroid. And down here, we've got Mr. James Wright, who is really, really doing fantastic work with membranes in the cat catalyst. Um, so let's come back to the central, the central core. The thing we did not know that existed in toxicity as, as a scientific culture, as a political culture, we didn't know until 1991 there was such a thing as endocrine disruption. Plenty of signals in the literature, but in 1991, this amazing woman, Theo Colborn, got a group of people together and they, oh my God, these chemicals are messing up aquatic life by interacting with their endocrine hormone system. And so um, an endocrine disruptor is an agent from outside the body that interferes with the relief, but production, release, transport, binding action of or elimination of natural hormones in the body responsible for homeostasis and particularly the regulation of developmental processes. Now you saw Shana Swan's face, I don't know if you remember, she was the lady that came up about second in the list of speakers. Shana has just um, done a meta-analysis of all sperm count studies in Western man. We are down 52% since 1973, 52%. Human male sperm counts have dropped in the West 52% since 1973. You look at other countries that are sort of more secretive about or more quiet about these things and you see all kinds of problems. You, you would have thought the Chinese would be in trouble. They've only had, so we, we can produce these effects with the chemicals in the lab animals, so the association there is very strong. You would have thought the Chinese would be in, um, in trouble because they are they have gone so chemical so quickly and they are not careful about what they do with the chemicals. So um, around six years ago, they don't have a, a major study of the Chinese population, to the best of my knowledge, but around six years ago they studied um, sperm donors, and they had um, height restrictions, and about 30,000, and 57% passed the bar, which is pretty good. They did it 18 months ago, no height restrictions, and 17% passed the bar. That's what I would expect, knowing, knowing because what, you're, what you have is you have this massive assault in the last couple of decades of chemicals into um, the Chinese uh, environment. They're very concerned about water and we're hoping to work with them, by the way. Um, this is the biggest thing to ever hit chemistry. It's like, 
It's like a locomotive coming and hitting it right in the body. Um, and how we deal with it, again, is a, an enormous test of our fortitude and, and, and character. Uh, this, is the, this is the group put, that we put together the um, tiered protocol for endocrine disruption. That are, that's one of our meetings. And the object is to ensure new, new chemicals like, like our catalysts are not, and their degradation products are not endocrine disruptors. But what do you do about the, something like the pill? What, do we get rid of the pill? Um, by the way, my personal advice to everybody is don't take the pill. Because it's got this incredibly potent estrogen. You take a teeny little bit, it gets into your, into your um, uh, blood and it fools you that you, if you're a woman that you're pregnant, so you don't, you don't ovulate. And then you go off the pill and it clears pretty quickly and you ovulate. But you, if you've been on it for a couple of years, you have to assume that it will have come to equilibrium, it's fat soluble. It will have come to an equilibrium concentration with everything in your body. And so once you take the equilibrium input off, Lichitalia's principle is going to take over and the stuff will leak back out slowly. And you don't even want <laughs> subparts per trillion of ethanol estradiol anywhere near a forming fetus. I would try barrier technologies and the old fashioned approaches. I'm, I feel I have to say that because of what I've, what I've learned about these things. Um, so many endocrine disruptors are integral to our city way of life. You're kind of damned if you do, if you don't, damned if you don't deal with them. Um, and so one of the things that you can do is much more effective product storage. Um, so we'll just, these are the toxicity studies and I'm going to buzz right by them uh, looking at the time there because I want to, uh, but they exist and they're very, they're very neat. <laughs> so we'll buzz right by them. So this is how the catalysts work. So there's the iron atom in the middle. There's the four nitrogens. There's the stuff that we change to get the properties that we want. And there's a water molecule sitting there. Oxygen's red, the two blue things are hydrogens. Um, when you put it with peroxide, it just incinerates virtually any, not everything, but m certainly most of the problematic endocrine disruptors. So I'm just gonna use a football as the substrate. And essentially what happens is this, the peroxide lands on the iron, you see the football getting oxygen on it, and then it gets more oxygen, and then after a while of this happening thousands of times per second, it's shredded to carbon dioxide and small molecules. Now, down in New Zealand, I changed the football. <laughs> so what is the football? Um, well, it's any dye. We've done hundreds. Um, so you can see it here. We're putting um, peroxide into the water, and we'll turn on the stirrers, and then we'll put, um, we'll put the catalyst in, and you can see those molecules decomposing, as you can see with your eyes as they disappear. And if I leave this running, they'll go, all go colorless. Um, pesticides, a number of them. Um, a bunch of drugs, explosive residuals, disinfectants. Um, cyanotoxin, the first one was done by Narish Gal here, cylindrosporin. At just the beginning, he's working with a catalyst that's 100 times less active than our best catalyst. We're going after cyanotoxins in a big way. Um, for not, so, so you get a cyanotoxin bloom, they put out these toxicants that um, kill everything, um, but also if you eat species with cyanotoxins, then they're, they're really not good, good for you either. Sulfur compounds, uh, we use them in, uh, in sugar, uh, uh, diabetes sensors, they can be used there, the Russians developed that. Various hormones, um, lots of endocrine disruptors, the critical thing. Um, phenomenal uh, disinfection technology, what we really started to get is absolutely phenomenal. It'll even split water reasonably well, the first water splitting reactions of iron. For chemists, it un activates unactivated CH bonds. Um, and here's mold stain removal. So I've shown this here once before. It's a technology that was developed in Indianapolis uh, by India Man Mold Remediation.
So you notice the black colour disappearing in seconds on contact? There's an infinitesimal amount of the catalyst in that solution. What they would normally do is go in and they'd scrub with the solution without the catalyst for a couple of days. It takes two, day, two day man days of labor is cut down to less than two hours by the catalyst. Very power, and that's, the, that's, that's uh, not by any means the most active catalyst. Um, and so here is for uh, a little bit of the science of killing of, of things. Bacterial spores are the ally anthrax or the surrogate that people use, Bacillus atrophius, that, isn't, that isn't, doesn't produce the tripartite toxin, um, um, is the hardest thing to call. Then come the protozoans that people, uh, uh, water people are often very worried about, then fungi, then virus, and then vegetative bacteria. So we start at the top level at, um, with a uh, Bacillus atrophius anthrax surrogate. This is what the spore looks like under the scanning electron microscope before you treat, sort of punctate, and there's a lot of stuff in the middle. When you treat, it swells up, and it's in a squirt out. Um, those are the conditions. Um, and so you start off with a, a solution that has 100 a million colony forming units per milliliter, and you, you, you want to get it down to meet the military target, you want to get it down to 10 in 15 minutes. And so as we just increase the concentration, Log, you want log of the number present among, over the initial number to go to minus seven in 15 minutes. And so nothing much happens with, um, uh, that's a tertiary butyl hydroperoxide actually. But as you increase, you increase the catalyst concentration, you see things going faster. And at 50 micromolar, by, by our, our standards, an enormous amount, um, by most people's hardly any, um, you see that. Get the seven log count. Well, you know, as always, I put way too much in the talk, and I want to leave some time, so I'm going to hop right to the end. Um, so our latest studies are with the city of Tucson's water. Uh, we, we studied 40 micropollutants. We're using our latest catalyst, hydrogen peroxide at 20 parts per million, the latest catalyst. You are competitive um, at, with four parts per million of ozone under those conditions. A kilogram of the catalyst will treat 22,500 tonnes of water. And it's fast, it's all over in an hour. 22, that quantity of water is the amount produced per day by 150,000 Europeans. So we, we really do think we've got something really nifty here. The only thing that could go wrong would be a nasty toxicity surprise. And so we're working on that. But I want to finish with a little bit more philosophy. Um, so this is just seeing a, um, this, this is um, propanolol. It's a beta blocker. Many people in the room might be taking propanolol. It's, it's a micropollutant, it's bioactive at tiny concentrations. Put peroxide in, nothing happens. Um, our first new Tamil did a pretty good job. Our best old Tamil beat it. Um, you want it to go to zero as quickly as possible. Um, the current best new Tamil takes it out, that quantity out in less than five minutes. You can see that's unbelievable catalysis. You have almost no catalyst there, 100 nanomole. Okay. So we, have, we think we have a good... But come back to this. What can New Zealand do? Well, you can train yourselves to think well and act well before the greatest challenge our species has ever encountered. The universities cannot continue to ignore this. They cannot continue to dismiss it. Um, so it's great to see a green chemistry centre here. I hope it thrives. The five loop approach is my best shot at it. You are critical to the good future of New Zealand in this regard. But it's going to take much more. It's going to take a change at the core of every human being, mind and heart, to save in the words of Han, Hans Jonas, a great Gnostic philosopher, the survival and humanity of man from the excesses of his own power. And so, just very quickly, what does a university do? Well, you know, when we, students come into this university, we take all these things in science and put it in their head, and the University of Auckland does that very well. 
I can attest from my own experiences, and I know the faculty, I know they're, they're very conscientious. Um, but there's all these other things having to do with sustainability, the death of fish, et cetera, et cetera. You've got to put those in at the same time somehow. You have to integrate the implications of technology. And the student goes out, therefore, equipped to be competent in, as a sustainability leader. We train the leaders of civilization. Forget about what people think about you now, okay? We've got all these prizes and things, and okay, I've got a few, but forget about it. What really matters is what the future thinks of you. Because they don't have anybody speaking for them. They don't have anybody. So forget about being, being, being famous and, and, and all of these other things that academia thrives on and think about the critical thing, the future. Um, it's a direction, not an end point. You sure as hell know, as we're doing, we are the epicenter in Pittsburgh of gas production in, 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 in the United States. You sure as hell know that's the wrong direction. The, the, the planet does not need another giant carbon technology. It needs solar, so it's directional. Um, it's tragic what's happening to biodiversity. It's, it's heartbreaking. Um, leaders champion biodiversity as a sort of a, a first um, pass uh, credential. The, the, our problem is our obsession with money and power. That dollar bill does not integrate the damage to the future. We externalize the damage and leave that to future generations to deal with and we take the cash that you can get and use it in the present. You've got to figure out how to make jobs, wealth, and sustainability mutually reinforcing. I was telling you that earlier on. You'd really have to go after these dudes that um, are creating, um, uh, denying sustainability problems. And right now, we are in big trouble in the US. God alone knows what we'll do. You have to resist the distortion of science at the expense of the common good. These all have a big lecture around them, of course, um, so I'm only just giving you. Never devalue sustainability for money, tribute, or political su support. It's the most precious thing you can imagine. And honestly, if you go and ally yourself with people you can trust to make the great faith with sustainability for any reason, you're going to have a great life as a, as a scientist. Thank you very much for your attention. We have time now for some questions. So. Uh, does anyone have uh, a question they would like to ask? Yes, down the front. Yeah, thank you. It's really interesting. I, I'm just wondering how long it would take, say, the third time, if we, um, if we had the technology to stop the disruptive environment now, given what we've got, how long would it take for that to come right? Um, it's hard to say. It's linear. The, lines, the line over the last decades is linear, so it's going to keep going, one assumes. Um, the, okay, so this brings us to the field of epigenetics, and it's completely possible to lock these disruptions in to future genetics. So um, Mike Skinner at the University of Western Washington um, exposed um, f female pregnant rodents to um, an antiandrogen estrogen and the males came up very obviously you can see with males they've been reproductively um, um, damaged and the postdoc accidentally bred from them they could still breed from them last I heard they were down nine generations nothing had changed they were all damaged so um, it is very public information. So if you look around and you see where population growth, for many reasons, obviously, but I think chemicals are part of it, is low. Um, and it, there's some delicate th things to say here, but they're very public. Uh, Christian Anna Moore did a um, program, Sex and Love Around the World, um, on CNN, um, and she visited Tokyo. And I, I've been to Japan many times, and the Japanese 100, 125 million people on a piece of real estate the size of the United Kingdom, but they can only live in 18% of it because it's mostly mountainous. And there's nowhere to put the rubbish. 
so they burn it. And so Osaka turns out to be the dioxin cap from burning organic chlorine waste, the dioxin ca capital of the world. Um, it looks like the Japanese have some severe problems. So if you look at their sperm counts, the few studies that have been done there rock bottom. Um, and a professor at one of their universities in Tokyo commented publicly, 40% of Japanese adult males are virgins. Sorry, it's tough to, tough to talk about. Um, if you, wherever you find populations very densely concentrated uh, and very, um, with very great um, chemical concentrations, the uh, chemicals are more and more part of their life, um, my guess is you will see these, these effects and I could go on and on to, to, to back that up. So I don't know. Some of my friends say it certainly solved the population problem. Ha biggest biggest uh, population growth are in Africa, Ghana, uh, uh, Democratic, 50 per 100,000 uh, women, I think. Um, um, lowest are Hong Kong, Korea, China, uh, uh, Japan. Plastics themselves are relatively inert, but it's all the additives that are the problem. So that if that's true, then you could legislate to replace the additives. Or yeah, but BPA is a, is a wicked, awful problem. We, uh, a friend of mine told me recently that the amount of money made by products with BPA in them is $750 million per hour. Get a part of a billion dollars per hour. So it's all the TVs and things. However, BPA they use in a lot of ways. So it's a radical trap. So they'll put it into other polymers that like polypropylene, polyethylene or whatever to, to stabilize them. And you know this because you can, you can boil them and get the stuff out. But the major thing is polycarbonate. Now polycarbonate is when you take, so BPA is the two phenols, the oxygens are out there and you couple them with phosgene, so you, 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 grab, you basically handcuff them together with a CO group. But that is a hydrolytically sensitive functionality. And so once, you in, once the hard plastics of our TVs and our goodness knows what make their way to the landfill and water starts running over them, they slowly, they're more than 90% BPA, they slowly start leaching BPA. That's the landfill problem. Um, I know what we do about BPA. It's, there are, there are people who have designed um, BPA analogs that aren't estrogens, that's for sure. Um, and um, I spend a lot of time doing that. More expensive, but um, you know, when you look at what's, what's, what's happening, uh, well, we uh, at least have to keep talking about it and hopefully address it. Yeah. I know what to do to reduce my footprint because, you know, without becoming a total minimalist. So what kind of three things would you recommend to focus on? Having this imprint and you know, my, my footprint, my carpet, and my environmental footprint. I, I think actually for someone your age, the most important thing you do is protect yourself. Because you're a, um, you're a, a step to the next generation. So, so, okay, so everywhere where, where you can get um, chemicals that you don't need out of your life is a good thing. So all these smells you have in your house, the nice smelling things, turns out a lot of those are highly problematic. Um, certainly um, try to eat organic. Um, by the way, um, if people take um, activated sludge from the, from the surge treatment part, and put it on the land, there's plenty of BPA in it, and it ends up in the vegetables. So if they're using activated sludge, it's not exactly organic um, as a fertilizer. I don't think New Zealand does that a lot, but it's done a lot in the US. Um, so, so essentially, um, I would try to, um, I, would, I would do it that way. Um, you, in the United States now, you have to pay more. It's ridiculous, you have to pay more for non-contaminated food. <laughs> Um, but you can, you can get um, 
chickens that are free range and that they don't use antibiotics or any, anything. Um, we had a practice in the United States, probably here, where people were feeding roxazone, which is an arsenic compound, to chickens. Lots of it. Reason is that um, arsenic compounds promote vascular growth, so the chicken gets bigger, fatter, fatter and plumper. Um, but the manure was full of arsenic. So then the chicken manure is going out and you're putting arsenic all over the place. So we, 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 we have such a massive re-evaluation to do of all the things that we do to really get this right. Um, you and people of your age um, are really important because we failed. We have failed collectively. My generation's failed. So we need you <laughs> to come in and take over and, and do it right or better. Yeah. Would you comment on, um, you're talking about testing for various things that go on over and over and over and see the effect and all this sort of thing. And um, I know that a lot of chemicals are tested by themselves. Would you comment on the synergistic effect of different things that are in the environment? Absolutely. Perf fantastic question. Yes, there are synergistic effects. Um, and we, we know very little about them. We, we have done some, there are some studies where people have taken such a low dose of a series of compounds that there's no ob observed effect. But when you put them all together, there's, there is an effect. Um, and so it appears to be at least additive, it may be more than additive. Um, that's yet another major part of the dimension. You see, the thing is, really to be a chemist, <laughs> in today's age, you really need to know what God knows about how life works so that you, you don't go and interfere with it. And, and um, again, the nice thing, at least as we know, is that there is a, the really big thing is, is one thing, endocrine disruption and other signal, there are other signaling pathways that, that you can, uh, hormones tell cells what to become. So if you, end up taking, for example, tributylin. Tributylin is used to stop barnacles growing on paint in, on, on the bottom of ships. But if you, if you feed tributylin to um, animals, um, it'll go and tell stem cells that wouldn't otherwise do this to go and become fat cells. And you'll make them extraordinarily fat. Or with, with um, Diethylstilbestrol, which is one of these lucky, not really lucky, but lucky cases where, where we have studies because people were given the drug um, thinking it was going to be okay and, and we could then study the effects. But you, you, give, you give one part per billion of diethylstilbestrol to rats, they'll blow up like balloons. You give 100 parts per billion and they'll be incredibly scrawny. That's how the endocrine system works. The dose response curve is not monotonic. And so, um, and what's more, you can take rats and look at the male, male reproductive tract, and you, the, it's being put together, as rats or mice, being put together day 13 through 17. So if you, you, you give the mum the, um, the chemical on day 13, 14, 15, 16, et cetera, and then go, look, different parts of the reproductive tract will be messed up on the different days, really dramatically so. So it's very hard when you have a time in development, say the human fetus. We've got this all worked out, actually. Uh, um, uh, Theo Colburn, while she's alive, set up um, uh, this wonderful um, critical uh, stages of development um, of the baby through from conception to post-birth where everywhere where there was a chemical that looked like it hit something, she, she signaled it all. So we, we actually do know quite a lot about it. Um, it's a matter of getting our med schools and everybody else to understand it. I think we're uh, running out of time. We can perhaps one last question. Oh, sorry, just a general question. You say avoid chemicals, but you have talk as time. Pardon? When, when you're coming about avoiding chemicals, I'm just wondering how you... In your food. Square that. So, so whenever, whenever anybody, especially a chemist, says avoid chemicals, chemists tend to circle the wagons and, 
and, and say, look at all the great things we've done, when we have done great things. We could not have this civilization without our chemicals. So let me just start by saying that I love chemistry and, and I know a lot about what chemistry's done for the world and it's absolutely incredible. However, we have these negative effects and that we have to deal with them. And my, my net evaluation is if you can avoid antibiotics, hormones, etc., in your food, avoid them. Right? I mean, you, 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 some of these, you're, you're, you're effectively taking a low dose of antibiotics by eating some of these things. Well, that messes up your GI tract. Everybody should take probiotics, by the way. That's another thing. Because your, um, your, uh, your, your GI tract, uh, people don't seem to understand how really important that is in taking our food in and breaking it down into the nu nu nutrition that we need. And I could describe you studies that, that make it crystal clear that having a very high functioning GI tract is critical to not getting dementia and other things. But anyway, I one could go on and on. Okay, I think sadly we are well over time, so I'd better draw things to a close now. I'd like to thank you, Terry, for, again, a, a, a wonderful talk, thought-provoking, challenging, informative talk, uh, and ask everybody to, to join with me in, in uh, thanking Terry. Thank you.